G'day Year 12 and welcome back to McGrathematics. Thank you for joining me. Hope you're all well. Today we are kicking off our new topic which is statistics. Alright, now I know that when a lot of people hear statistics and data in mathematics, their first thought is... Oh no! God! No! God! Please no! 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 So I'm going to try and make this as quick and painless as I can and try not to dwell on stuff that you would have seen already and focus more on the new content. Okay, as always, we're going to kick off with a revision question. This one's a calculus question. I want you to find the integral of cos 2x over 3 plus sine 2x with respect to x. All right, if you could pause the video, have a go, that'd be good because I'm going to go through the answer very shortly. Like now, actually, here is your answer. So hopefully you recognized that if you put a two up the top of this fraction, which means you need to put a half out the front, so you're multiplying by one. Uh, now that's good because the derivative of three plus sine two x, well, three goes to zero and sine two x goes to cos two x times two, which is right here. Okay, so well done if you recognize that you can use logarithms here by putting a two up top. Now the top is the derivative of the bottom. So the integral will be the half out the front ln absolute value of the bottom uh, plus your constant. Okay, great job if you got it. So today for our first lesson in stats, we are going to look at classifying and displaying data. Very exciting. All right, starting off looking at some vocab that we use in this course to classify types of data. So first of all, the two big main ones are data is typically either numerical or categorical. Okay, it's either numbers or it's categories. All right. Uh, but we get a bit more specific than that. We can say for numerical data, we can call data discrete. Okay, now when I say discrete data, I mean that all the possible options are going to be distinct. Okay, uh, what that means usually is that you're counting your data rather than measuring it. Okay, uh, so for example, number of students in a room is not something you would measure, it's something you would count. Okay, the reason this is distinct values, the reason this is discrete is because it can only be whole numbers. Okay, there could be 6, 7, 17, 27 students in a room. There can't be 16.54 students in a room. Okay, there are distinct values for our data. It's, it's not going to be a continuous decimal, so this makes it discrete. Okay, another one would be days since last beer. That's something that you wouldn't measure. You would count that, and we're going to assume it would be whole days. Okay, so whole numbers, discrete, will make sense. Okay, if it's not discrete, it's often called continuous, which typically means you are measuring. All right, so instead of counting the number of students in a room, if I was measuring the height of the students in the room, that would be continuous data. All right, because it doesn't have to be whole numbers, it doesn't have to be 180, 181, etc. It could be 180.576420. All right, so when there's no limit on the outcomes of your uh, data, it's going to be called continuous. Okay, another uh, comparison could be instead of days since last beer, Instead of, uh, we could have liters of beer consumed, which again would be a measurement. It could be 3.724 liters. All right. So enough about numbers. Now for categories, there's two classifications for categorical data in this course. We have ordinal categories. So this is when your categories can be uh, clearly organized in some apparent order. All right. Two main ones that I gravitate towards are report grades. So A, B, C, D, E, F. These are categories and there is a clear order to them. It's alphabetical order. All right. Another one would be shirt sizes, small, medium, large, XL. These are categories. There is a clear order from smallest to largest. So it would be ordinal data. All right. The way I remember this is that ordinal data is ORD for order. Okay. Ordinal has order. Makes sense. And the other type of categorical is called nominal. So this is the flip side of that. This is when there is no clear order. Okay, nominal, N-O, no clear order. All right, colors are categories with no clear order. Um, I guess you could argue that you could put it on the color spectrum, but this is typically for clear order, not tenuous order. So usually they should be pretty straightforward. Uh, brands of beer is another one. These are categories. There's no clear order to them. I guess you could do uh, in order of price, but there isn't a clear order, so it's going to be nominal. Okay, it's only ordinal when there's a really obvious way of ordering them, typically. Okay, so let's have a go at applying these definitions. So here are five pieces of data. 
that I want you to classify using those definitions that you hopefully just wrote down. All right, so pause the video, have a think about uh, where these five data types fit into one of those four categories. Answer coming very soon, like right now. All right, for shoe size, that's going to be a number, typically. Shoe sizes like 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, uh, etc. And because you see 8 and 9 shoe sizes and you see 8.5, but personally, I've never seen 8.25. I've never seen 9.169. It's usually uh, distinct values of 0 0.5. Okay, so even though it's not whole numbers, there are distinct types. So this would classify as discrete uh Discrete numerical data would be this one. All right, for B, political parties are, of course, categories. There's no clear order for political parties, I would argue. You could say you could order them from most left to most right, but I wouldn't say there's a clear order. So this one would be categorical, and it would be nominal because there is no clear order. All right, the controversial one for C, we have the stench rating from 0 to 10 of Noah's farts. Uh, this is obviously numerical data. But it's a bit tenuous because if we say we are only allowing whole numbers or 0.5s, like uh, if I said you can only have 7 or 7.5 or 8, this would be discrete, unlike Noah's farts. This would be discrete data, all right? But if you allow things like 7.781242, it now becomes continuous. Okay, so we're going to keep it simple and say that we're only allowing whole numbers from 0 to 10. So there's, there's only 11 possibilities, which means it is discrete. Okay, if you allow decimal points as far as you can go, it would now be continuous. All right, for D, we have the letter of your first name. So a letter is not a number, so it's going to be categorical. And we ask ourselves, is there a clear order for the letters? Yes, there is. It's called alphabetical order. So D would definitely be categorical and it would be ordinal because we can order them. And for E, this one goes out to Brittany, time taken to run 100 meters. Uh, so this one would be a number because it would be a time. And you have to ask yourself, do you count how long it takes someone to run 100 meters or do you measure it with a stopwatch? The answer is, of course, measure. All right. There isn't a limit on the values for a time. Okay, You can have 9.4, you can have 9.314. You've got uh, endless opportunities and it's a measurement. So it's going to be it's going to be numerical, of course, and it's going to be continuous. All right, moving on, we're going to have a look at some of the statistical displays we explore in this course. Here's a bit of an overview. We're going to dive in with our first contestant, which is the histogram. Okay, way more important than Instagram, in my opinion. All right, so on the left, we have a distribution table, a frequency distribution table. We have scores and we have frequencies. Okay, so this is our data and this is how many times it occurred. This is represented in our histogram here. Okay, we have frequency. We have scores for our year 12, ooh, let's fix that, year 12 maths essay marks. All right. So the height of the column represents how many times it happened. Pretty straightforward. We can jazz it up a bit by putting on top this fancy red line called the frequency polygon, or it's also referred to as an OGIV. Okay, so what you see here is we're joining the center of every column and we're joining it to zero and we're making this pretty line dot to dot like in kindergarten. It's beautiful. We'll be using these lines uh, in later lessons. They're good for estimating stuff, as you'll see. But for now, you just need to be aware that you join the sensors, and that's really all there is to it. Um, note that the bars are next to each other. There's, there shouldn't be gaps in a histogram for numerical data. And notice that there is a gap here because we aren't starting at zero. We're starting at three. So there should be a bit of a gap there, but no gaps here. So just be aware of that. All right, for our next one, so here we have what's called a grouped frequency table. Okay, If you have lots of different data points and you don't want to have a table that's got 40 to 140 uh, rows, you group your data like this. Okay, So the scores from 40 to 49, there was one of those. From 50 to 59, there's four of those. This just sort of summarizes it a bit more. All right. For this, we're going to add a class center, so the middle of these classes, which we'll get to uh, next lesson, I think, why that's important. Uh, what we're going to look at right now is the cumulative frequency. You may have seen this in year 10, but in case you haven't, I'll re-explain it. So the cumulative frequency essentially means how many so far. So in the first class, we've got them in ascending order. The first class, there's one score, so there's one so far. 
Now in the second class, there's four scores, so there's five so far. Next one has eight, so there's 13 so far. And as you can see, these numbers are just adding on each time. And why this is good is because at the end, we get 25, which must be how many scores there are. Okay, because all these numbers are adding up to give 25. So this data set has 25 pieces of data. Okay, we can display this with a histogram. Instead of a frequency histogram, this is a cumulative frequency histogram. So the bars should always be climbing if you've done it correctly. And once again, we can put a polygon on or an ogive if you prefer. Um, something you may have noticed that's different to the, uh, to the frequency polygon ogive is that this one is not joining the centers of the columns, it's joining the end lines, the corners. All right, and again, we'll uh, show why that's important in a couple of lessons time. So that's the key differences. Uh, yeah, cumulative frequency instead of frequency and join the corners, not the centers is basically it. Next up, we have the stem and leaf plot, a very popular plot. This is just basically splitting your numbers into two pieces. So this data set is essentially 47, 51, 53, etc. All right, so the stem is our tens and our leaves are our units in this case. All right, this is good because you still get an idea of the shape of the data set if you want to sort of uh, analyze whether it's uh, whether it's symmetric or clustered. A stem and leaf plot gives you a good idea of the, of the shape as long as you've spaced it out correctly. Now we have two-way tables, a uh, very basic one. This is just for comparing two pieces of information. In this case, it's having a dog or having a cat. So a quick example, we have 19 people who have a dog and a cat. We have uh, 47 people who have a dog but don't have a cat. And yeah, so on and so forth, pretty straightforward. 54 have neither and 32 have a cat but not a dog. All right, we can do bar charts, which are different histograms. Okay, bar charts are typically for categorical data, which is why we have gaps now, because they're not numbers. And yeah, you know what a bar chart is, frequency, number of times, pretty straightforward. Sector graph, again, one I'm hoping you're familiar with. So the size of the sector represents the frequency. So in this case, brown would be a bit over half the data set. And so you can construct these by having uh, angle sizes for your sectors that represent the proportion of the data set. All right. All right, now we get to uh, what is probably my least favorite part of the standard course, and I'm guessing it's now my least favorite part of the advanced course, Pareto charts. All right, these are very complicated <laughs> to explain in my opinion, and they're very complicated to construct. So I'm gonna try and go very slow, but you might need to watch this a couple of times before it makes complete sense to you. All right, first of all, we have our data on the left here. Okay, I think these are ratings for categories of TV shows, I hope. So here's our categories, here's our frequencies, and all up we have 500 people counted. Okay, what we're going to do is we're going to rearrange these so they are in descending order. Okay, sport is number one up top, reality is next, and then down the bottom is news, but not these days. All right, so here's our data arranged in descending order. And the next column is called the percentage frequency. All right, percentage frequency. What this means is 174 out of 500 is 34.8%. 107 out of 500 is 21.4%. All right, so we're translating these frequencies as percentages out of the total. Okay, hope that makes sense. Now, the next column is a mouthful. It's the cumulative percentage frequency. All right, so that's the same concept as cumulative frequency. But instead of accumulating these guys, we're accumulating these guys. Ah, so we're starting off with 34.8%. The next one adds on 21.4% to get here. Then we add on 15.6%, so on and so forth. And if you've done it correctly, you should get that at the end, you've got 100% of the data set so far. All right, so now we construct our chart. So first things first, we do a frequency histogram all right, and we have to do it in descending order like we have here. All right, so our frequencies on the left and our categories or data on the x-axis. All right, now we have to graph the cumulative percentage frequency on the same graph using a line, all right, that looks like this, which is pretty assaulting to the eyes. So like I said, we have the cumulative percentage frequency uh, graphed on the y-axis as well, which is why these are so confusing is because they're basically two charts superimposed on one. 
all right? Twice the fun with half the space. So for sport, we have a cumulative percentage frequency of 34.8%. So we do the end line of sport, 34.8%, we do a dot there. Okay, so we join here to here. Now the next one, we have a cumulative percentage frequency for reality of 56.2%. All right, so the end line of reality, we go up and we meet it at 56.2% roughly. Do, 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 do. There, boom. We draw a dot there, dot to dot, and we keep doing that until we get this Pareto line. All right, again, if you've done it correctly, you should end up at 100% just here. And that's the idea. All right, it's a bit of a pain in the ass, but as I said, it's um, you're probably unlikely to be asked to chart one of these because it's very involved and time consuming. More likely, you'll be given a Pareto chart and asked questions about it. Okay, so you don't, so you just need to know the know the logic behind what's happening over here, what's happening over here, and what this line means. All right, look, it's not it's not pretty, but it is an actually important concept. It's sort of trying to explain what's called the Pareto concepts. Okay, if you Google the Pareto principle, it'll tell you that 80% uh, of the output is caused by 20% of the contributors. Okay, what that means is that for a lot of statistics, say for example, uh, economic output, if you look at world economic output, you will see that 80% of the output is contributed to by 20% of the countries in the world, so about 40 countries. All right, 40 countries in the world are going to be doing most of the heavy lifting, whereas the other 160 plus are not doing as much. They're only doing the last 20%. Okay, so it's 80% it's of the work being done by 20% of the people. This makes more sense if you've ever done a group assignment with five people. Okay, five people, so 20%, one person does pretty much all the work, 80%. All right, that's the Pareto principle. 80% of the work being done by 20% of the people, which if your Pareto chart is done correctly, should kind of show. The last one was a bit um, strange, but this one you can see, this is restaurant complaints. We have a number of complaints, but as we can see, two of them are causing most of our percentage total. Okay, so uh, what we can extrapolate for this restaurant is that yes, you have lots of different complaints, but if you just address these two areas, your price and your portions, you can reduce your overall complaints by 80% roughly. So that's the logic. It's just trying to see what which one of your categories is doing the heavy lifting, showing it with a line essentially. All right, that's really it. So for today's exercise, you can have a look at 901 and 902 in the stats chapter. I'm not going to say do every second question because these are quite repetitive and they can be a bit mind numbing, and I realize that. All I'll ask that you do is a variety of questions. So try and do one of each type, try and cover all the concepts, and just make sure you're familiar and it's making sense. All right, that's all for today. So thanks very much for watching if you made it this far. Um, I'll see you next time. Thank you.